My name is Margaret McHale, as you said, and uh, I was born into a family of 11 children. And for the past 50 years or a bit more, I've been a Sister of Mercy. A bit chaotic, yeah, we were in a, we lived in a, a very humble home and my dad died when we were all pretty young. So um, there was still a tremendous care and love and um, great faith, yeah. And it was a struggle, you know, it was hard for my mom, but she was something else. I went to primary school in Kalala and um, Caramore, and then I went to the sisters in the secondary school in Balmullet. I was a boarder there and they were very happy years, yeah. I have, I have very nice memories of those years, yeah. I used to have this niggling feeling, you know, that I wanted to do something and I denied it and didn't talk about it. And I remember distinctly the night when I uh, kind of made a decision. I was at a, a dance in the ballroom in Pantone and uh, I loved dancing. I had a lovely night and then I went to the bathroom and I found myself talking to myself and saying, you know, there's some emptiness in my life. I, I, I want something else. And like that thought had been coming now for a long time. So I said, you know, I'll have to give this a try. So in 1966, I entered the convent in Ballina. And, you know, Mercy wasn't a big, um, um, I didn't think about it that much, and it wasn't in my vocabulary that much, but what was, was goodness and kindness. And as I said, I think I got to, I have a feeling that, our ideals and values are formed in childhood and in our young years. And that's certainly the way it was for me. Um, as I said, we struggled, but we were very loved and everybody given the opportunity to be educated and that. And it was an open house, really. We laugh about it now. People seem to come and stay and go. And I don't know where we all were sleeping, heads and tails, I think. And um, at that time, there was a, something happened to me. We used to have, uh, travellers used to call quite often to our home. And that was the first time that I became familiar with their way of life and that. And they loved coming and we loved to see them coming. They'd be telling us stories about their own uh, lifestyle. And at that time, they were mostly living on the side of the road. So we loved to see them coming. And we, we were friends. Yeah. So out of that, I had this great desire to be a social worker. And thankfully, my request was granted. So I did my degree in Maynooth and then I uh, qualified as a social worker in UCD. So when I came back home then, uh, I got work with Western Health Board, as it was then, and uh, did family casework and community work and that kind of thing. And so I worked with the Health Board for about 10 years. And during that time, a colleague, Therese, and myself, we became very conscious of the poverty that surrounded even the offices we were working in and, and around the convent area as well. So we did a survey anyway, and what came out of that was that the need for something for the youngsters. From all of that, we set up the uh, Cara Youth Club in Ballina. In Ballina. In Ballina. Yeah. So we attracted lots of children from the area and lots of volunteers, including quite a big number of sisters from the convent as well. And it was a social club, but as you know, a social club is not just a, so, you know, we did all kinds of stuff and development work. And, um, you know, I think that the leaders enjoyed it as much as the children. We had great fun, simple times. And now it wasn't all plain sailing, mind you. So um, I was still now working full time in the health board at this stage. 
But one night I was um, called to the front door and there was a traveller girl asking, she wanted to talk. So she told me that every day she was sent downtown to get work, to get a job. And a uh, very capable girl. But the minute she said her name and her address, all doors were closed against her. I, I remember so well that night, I was very upset myself and I had a very restless sleep. I thought, my goodness, the barriers and the discrimination that's facing the traveling community. So gave it a lot of thought and planning in my head and wondered if there was anything we could do. So went to my superior anyway, Sister Phyllis, and I said, could I leave my paid work? in the help board and experiment with something for those youngsters. And she very graciously said yes. I was on my own in the thought, apart from sharing it with different friends and that. But then got a group together and um, we had a most big hearted, warm sister in Balna, Sister Aquinas. So she knew what was going on and she founded the Emmanuel House for people with disabilities. Anyway, a group of women was that time. We set off early in the morning and we went up to the, it was a house in Shani Heights in Balna. So we had no money and we thought and come up with a plan anyway. So we went up early and we cooked loads of apple tarts and scones and sausage rolls and hit off to all the factories. And the lads were delighted to see us coming, you know. And uh, health and safety, how are you? Oh my God, I, I shiver to think about those days. But eventually, anyway, we applied to the VC. And they came and visited us and when they saw what we were at, they funded the tutors. Like it was mostly numeracy, literacy, um, all kinds of skills, you know. So at that time, something very exciting happened as well. The Mayo Association in Manchester um, gave us a minibus and the Variety Sunshine Coach. They often do that with different projects. So did the test, got it, and this was creating a totally different dimension for the project. Uh, before that, it was all indoors, but now we were able to expose the youngsters to all kinds of things and places. So we went here, there and everywhere, right. Uh, and um, that was again very kind of um, exciting time and the, the children loved it, you know, they were learning and yeah. It was kind of home to home like, the, yeah, yeah, we, we got on very well. But during that time then after a good number of years, I felt, well, not sick, but I was very uh, low in myself and I had no energy and I was heartbroken because my mom and sister died within a fortnight of each other. And sure, I didn't grieve, didn't know how to grieve at the time. And uh, I just knew I needed to take a break from that. And during that time then, I used the time, I did courses and different things, but the best thing that I ever did, I qualified uh, as a counsellor with the Irish Association. And this proved to be such a gift later on. Now I was uh, involved with people in a much more meaningful way, because during the process, I like my own grief and woundedness came very much to the fore. So working through that was tough, but it gave me, as I had, the best gift of my life. I was on retreat in Mullinmore and I got this phone call out of the blue and from this lady and she said, would you ever think of going to Africa? And I said, what would I be doing in Africa? And she had been there herself and after a lot of talking and persuasion, I said, well, right, I'll give it a two year commitment. So off I go to Africa. And um, my goodness, like I couldn't express the 
shock and the sadness I felt when I was there. Witness the poverty and misery of the people there. I did, um, I did counselling in two of the secondary schools and I did community work with health workers and that. But I engaged a lot with the native people and it, it, it was so humbling, you know, invited into their shack. It was, I couldn't call it a home and um, getting the bit of food that they so badly needed themselves. So all of that, while it was uh, upsetting, yeah, privilege and it humbled me a lot. I often felt tears in my eyes, you know, just seeing what they were trying to live with. And also I was um, living with Sisters of Mercy there and that was very enriching and I was in great admiration of the many projects and work that they were doing for the people in South Africa. Well, it was very soon after apartheid as well and um, that was such a shock like that people, somebody with me would be treated so differently and um, yeah, I wouldn't have experienced the level of um, destitution, really, that I experienced in, that, in South Africa. So then I came home and I was asked to set up a community employment scheme for travellers in Castlebar. A bit daunting, resisted it a bit, but deep down I knew I'd give it a try. So we set to work, got a group of people that were interested and the council gave us a house in the town in Castlebar and we had painted and it was beautiful and the plan was in place and the next thing we were evicted because very once the locals heard what was happening in the house they objected and the council said there was no way we'd have peace there. Again a great awakening for me. This is what it means to be a traveller. So then the council gave us a house in the country, but only a condition that somebody would live there. So I was the obvious person. So I had um, chats and in consultation with Sister Cotchling. I remember her saying, well, Margaret, if you want to do this, you go ahead and do it. So um, Sonos, project was set up. This was an adult education for the travellers. They totally knew to them. They loved coming, meeting up with each other and they were learning and they had a chance of education for the first time. And oh, look at, you know, I would have so many memories, but one big thing was the millennium. Everyone was saying, what are you doing for the millennium and where are you going and all this. and. So they, what they wanted, they wanted the bishop to come and say mass for them. That was the first thing. Thank you, Bishop Michael Neary came. Yeah. The second thing was um, um, we want to go to Lourdes. Totally kind of. But then someone said she take responsibility, go to the credit union every week until the money was raised. We went to Lourdes. And the third thing, we'd love to have a ball. And of course, I thought it was a, a traveller's ball. Oh no, not a traveller's ball for everybody. So highways and byways, and we got a packed hall that night. My brother Damien played the music and we danced the night away, great time. So there was a lot of, it wasn't just learning and uh, very serious stuff. We just had a great time. When we'd everything established very well, the VEC came and took it over completely. So um, at that time as well, the women were very concerned. They couldn't do the homework with the children. So Sister Frances Gardner, Nora Conway and myself put the heads together. And out of that, well, the Acorn After Schools Club was established. So working in the halting site, we're there now 20 years. And the children now were doing their homework, had the dignity and the pride going into school. And the teachers loved it, the kids, we all loved it. Yeah, but again, much broader than just doing homework. We did everything, celebrated everything, Christmas plays, everything. The teachers supported it, they all came to the Christmas story. And so it was a very happy place. One, a little girl said to me one day, nine-year-old, she said, why do you like us? And I said, why wouldn't I like you? 
and she said, I know it's just that no country person, country person being a settled person, no country person likes us. And imagine the impact of that coming from a child, but also her mindset for the rest of her life. So I'm sad to say there is still a lot of discrimination and exclusion. So my, I suppose my dream and my vision is that all of us would try to replace harshness with gentleness, marginalization with inclusion and equality, and um, poverty with fairness. Everything I do and say comes from mercy and compassion. Um, it's, um, it's with me all the time and I have, as a Mercy sister, now it wasn't all a bit of roses for me, but I'm very grateful that I got an opportunity to um, realise my dream and to fulfil my heart's desire. And a lot of thanks goes to the Mercy sister in the Western province who supported every project that I was involved in.